just being polite. You always reinsert the needle inside an area that's full of local anesthesia, at least one centimeter inside the tumescent boundary. Did that hurt at all? Good. Did that hurt? That hurt a little bit? Yeah. That's not? Yeah. And if you inject 40 milliliters on the whole ulnar side of the hand, it doesn't hurt at all. She felt zero pain during the surgery. If people feel pain during the surgery, it's always because you did not put enough volume. Do not be afraid to put in a lot of volume. So this man uh, is in uh, Ghana, and he is four days after a gunshot wound to his hand. It took him four days to get to the hospital in Kumasi, Ghana, where I was that day. And I injected 40 cc's on the palm, 40 cc's on the dorsum. This was an open wound filled with pus and dirt and debris. And we went to the sink and washed out the wound and injected or in, you know, squirted the wound with bridine, betadine, and clean water. Uh, bottled water after using tap water because the tap water was not so clean. And then we K-wired the fractures and then admitted him to the hospital. He never went to the operating room. He just went in a minor procedure room outside the main operating room. This is uh, Elizabeth Hoggart doing uh, wrist surgery in Sweden. Once again, you inject enough tumescent local anesthesia that it's at least two centimeters beyond wherever you're going to insert a sharp object or uh, manipulate sore bones. So here she's doing a TFCC repair and here she's doing wrist arthroscopy. Uh, this is Amir Ahmad who's in Malaysia showing you how to inject local anesthesia for a clavicle fracture. Everywhere that's blue, you inject subcutaneously and you inject all along the periosteum of the bone, wherever you're going to put a plate and screw. For the deep border of the periosteum, he waits until the skin is open and he does the undersurface of the clavicle under direct vision so that he doesn't hurt the subclavian vessels. And this is the video sped up. And the main thing is to put in a lot of volume and now he's injecting on the periosteum. You have to bathe the entire periosteum of long bones. Now he's into the fracture hematoma. And whether you're doing a clavicle, an ankle, a distal radius, an elbow, or any of those uh, bones, you always have to bathe the entire periosteum beyond wherever you're going to put a screw. So you need to get the distal end of the cortex on the other side of the screw when you're doing this work. Uh, and then he tests the stability and for him, this has greatly decreased the cost of surgery in Malaysia, especially in people who are frail, who can't tolerate uh, general anesthesia. This is uh, Chen Yu Chen, who is in uh, Taiwan, and he's gonna show you how he does his ankle fractures. Uh, and it's the same thing that Dr. Ahmad just showed you from Malaysia. So you always go from proximal to distal, 
always inject big volume of dilute local anesthesia. So here he's injecting up to 100 milliliters of 0.5% lidocaine with one in 200,000. Now he's injecting into the space between the ankle. Between the tibia and the fibula. And here's the patient at the end of the surgery. And if you have somebody who has morbid obesity or bad lungs or has other problems with uh, uh, medicine, then it's a much safer way to do the surgery. Dr. Chen did a prospective randomized trial of distal radius fracture plates with general anesthesia versus Wallant and showed many advantages for Wallant for distal radius fracture. Uh, this is Amir Ahmad also showing ankle fracture and it's the same thing. These videos are all sped up, but it's always about big volume, first under the skin, then under all around the periosteum uh, and make sure that there's plenty of volume. It's always about the tissues need to be tumescent. Tumescent means very swollen with local anesthesia. And there's Dr. Ahmad's case at the end uh, showing you that the patient is completely awake with zero sedation. This is uh, Dr. Ahmad doing a tibia fracture fixation. I'm showing you all these surgeons because I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. I'm a plastic surgeon, so I don't do this surgery, but orthopedic surgeons all over the world in the United States and South America and uh, Asia have started doing long bone fractures wide awake. And uh, the morbidity is less, the cost is less, it's much safer than general anesthesia. You know, the mortality, the odds of you dying in the United States from a general anesthetic, if you are healthy and if you have an elective operation is one in 100,000. Your risk of dying in the United States from general anesthesia is one in 100,000. The risk of losing a finger with epinephrine is much less than that. So, uh, if you're still worried about losing a finger, think about killing a patient. Uh, that is a much more severe possible problem. Uh, this is a uh, patella fracture. And I'm just sharing with you some of the things that you can do outside of the hand. I know this is a talk about hand surgery, but it's also important that you understand that uh, as long as you inject big volume, uh, you can do big areas and you're going to have pain-free patients. And if you inject the local anesthesia properly, it doesn't hurt. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more today. This is an elbow fracture. Uh, elbows, you uh, are a little more complicated because you're actually looking at three different bones there. Well, it's not unlike the ankle. And uh, it's the same principle. You uh, first inject subcutaneously, then you bathe the periosteum all along where there's going to be a plate or a screw. Uh, and then once you're done, you can test the movement and make sure that the movement is good, that you can rotate the um, radius, uh, in the elbow joint and that everything is working well. So uh, that's a little bit of an introduction to some of the things that you can do with wall ant. And now we're going to talk about how to prepare wall ant a little bit. Uh, in hand surgery, wherever there's movement, Dupuytren's contracture, complex secondary surgery, arthroplasty, uh, or even in the thumb, trapeziectomy, you can Joint make sure that everything that the thumb is, is moving well. properly and you can decide if you want to do a ligament reconstruction or not if you're doing arthritis surgery. 
And I decide if I'm going to do a ligament reconstruction or just a trapeziectomy based on what I see with active movement at surgery. If the patient is moving nicely and the scaphoid is not grinding on the metacarpal, I stop after trapeziectomy. If the metacarpal is grinding on the scaphoid, then I do an LRTI. When you're doing an arthroplasty of the PIP joint, you really want to make sure that your extensor tendon is nicely reconstructed before you close the skin. So this is how you prepare it. All you need to remember is that 50 milliliters of 1% lidocaine with one in 100,000 epinephrine is extremely safe. The seven milligram per kilogram rule that was invented in 1949 when lidocaine was invented. There have been three plastic surgery papers since then that have shown that we can use up to 35 milligrams per kilogram, so five times that dose, and still have a safe blood level of lidocaine in the blood. So if you stick with seven milligrams per kilogram, if you stick with 50 milliliters of 1% lidocaine with one in 100,000, that is not only safe, that is extremely safe. And that's why we don't even monitor patients when we're using extremely safe levels of local anesthesia. The usual Wallant recipe is if, if we only need 50 milliliters, we use 1% with one in 100,000. If, if we need 50 to 100 milliliters, like in the case that you saw me do in the wrist, then I dilute it 50-50 with saline. So I add, 50, uh, I add saline to make a half percent with one in 200,000. I add 50 milliliters of saline to my bottle of 50 milliliters of lidocaine with epinephrine. If I'm doing a forearm tendon transfer, or if you're doing a fractured tibia or a fractured elbow, then you can drop your concentration to one quarter percent with one in 400,000 by adding 150 milliliters of saline to your 50 milliliters of lidocaine. And you still have three hours to finish your case before you have pain. So if you have quarter percent with one in 400,000, you have three hours to do your surgery. At the count of three, you're gonna feel a little poke and I'm gonna ask you to try to not move, okay? One, two, three, four, three. And, and I really hate needles, just despise them. This needle was nothing. Absolutely nothing. He kind of pressed on my hand three times and then he put the needle in and it wasn't uncomfortable. And then in a few seconds, it, it all went away. I felt the first poke. It was not painful. Not, not, not even a twinge, not, no discomfort whatsoever. No discomfort whatsoever. There's a tiny, tiny prick, which is not even worth mentioning. I didn't need to have any blood tests done. I didn't need to have the chest x-ray done. No tests. Well, I did not have to go in for tests. So uh, this is uh, a much less expensive, much more convenient thing for patients. All these people are talking about what it's like to have carpal tunnel surgery. And uh, we're doing them all outside the operating room and minor procedure rooms so they don't have to get undressed. And they have zero nausea and vomiting. People who have sedation have a 7% chance of nausea and vomiting. And none of us like nausea. Uh, and so if you want zero nausea, just stop putting people to sleep. So this is a true injection. Time. So for carpal count tunnel. three, try not to move, okay? You're gonna feel a little poke. One, two, three. Very good. You hardly moved a muscle. Now that's gonna sting a little bit for just a short period of time. Can you please tell me when the sting is all gone? Can you hardly feel it? Oh, that's good. 
So can you just tell me when it's all gone though? Because it probably stinks still a little bit, right? A little tiny bit, yeah. Yeah. Okay, can you please tell me if you feel any sting at all in the next five minutes? Okay. That's great. I want you to see real injection time. So this hand is going to be on strike for the next two or three days. It's only going to do one thing. It's going to stay higher than your heart. You know what? I've got a sling at home where I had my shoulder done. Yeah. And I've got it in my bag. I'm going to be wearing it. I'm going up to my son's house for a couple of days, so they'll be in there. Oh, okay. Just don't want you walking with your hand dangling down by your side. That's right. That's why I set up with the sling on. Uh, but the problem with a sling, though, you might start to get a stiff shoulder or a stiff elbow. Oh, is that right? Yeah, so we're not too crazy about that. I don't mind if you wear the sling for a little part of the time. Okay. But not all the time, okay? All right. You want to keep that elbow and that shoulder moving. Mm -hmm. I just don't want a lot of walking around with your hand dangling down. Okay. You can sit with your hand up on the kitchen table like your grandmother told you not to. <laughs> or you can put it up on the couch. Uh, just just not swinging by your side because then you might get a clot in your hand. And if you get a clot, it takes longer to get better. That didn't hurt, eh? No, not at all. So, so far, you've just felt the first little poke, right? Right. And since then, no pain? No. Great. So uh, what do you normally take for pain? Advil, Tylenol, Tylenol. nothing? Tylenol, perfect. Well, you know, that's all you're going to need for this. Uh, you're not going to need anything stronger than that. No. If you keep your hand up higher than your heart, by about five hours from now, the sting of the cut is going to come in because the freezing is going to go away. Mm -hmm. When the sting of the cut comes in, you go ahead and take Tylenol like you normally do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, by tomorrow or the next day, the sting of the cut's going to be gone. And you're going to get into the pain of, gee, doctor, now it only hurts when I put my hand down or when I do stuff. Exactly. Once you get into the pain of, gee, doctor, now it only hurts when I put my hand down or when I do stuff. That's when you quit taking painkillers and listen to your body. Don't do the stuff that hurts. I don't take painkillers unless I absolutely need them. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's not a bad thing at all. So you felt the first little sting of the poke. Mm -hmm. And have you felt any pain at all since then? No. Okay, well, we're all done the freezing. That's it. Oh. So if you inject local anesthesia properly, they only feel one little poke at the beginning. And that's a 27 gauge needle I'm using. It's very small. All of you can go find the person in your hospital who orders the needles and ask to see their screen so that you can see the needles that they can use, they can buy and they can buy smaller needles. You don't need giant needles. So I mostly use 27 gauge needles. And also you saw how slowly my needle moved. The whiter my hair gets, the slower my needle moves and the less it moves. If you put 20 milliliters right there, where's it gonna go? Everywhere. This is like an extravascular beer block, but only where you need it and extremely safe. Standard tray for carpal tunnel forceps, little driver, little prep solution. Swing around and show this. It's part of the part that we need. Tomorrow, you can go ahead and get in the shower and wash all this brown stuff off, eh? And I'm just going to cover your wound here a little bit. Tell me if I bother you even one little bit during surgery here. Can you straighten out your fingers for me? Oh, that's great. Thanks a lot. You didn't think we were going to be asking you to help, did we? <laughs> Is it hurting at all? I'm sure you can feel me pushing. Not really or not at all? No. Stop. I'll get you right there. Right there. 
I need, I got this one, thank you. I need you to pull about that hard. The key to success here is pulling quite firmly. The harder you pull, the easier this is. It feels a little strange for her. Does that feel a little strange for you? Yeah, and you can sometimes feel the sound of the grit. Mm -hmm. Feeling the sound is something that is hard to understand unless you've actually had this operation, but I have had this operation, so I know what it feels like. So here we go until we see that fat pad nicely pouting out like that. So you can see that there's a little blood. This is not bloodless surgery, but you can see very well. And really, it's, it's not that big a deal to do. I like to educate the patient during the whole procedure. And I like to close with these buried monocryl sutures. So this hand is on strike. It only does one thing in the next two or three days, and that's to stay up higher than your heart, just like this. I need you to look over for a second. I need it just like this. I don't want you doing this. I don't want you walking around with your hand dangling down, because if you move your fingers or walk around with your hand dangling down in the next 24 hours, it's going to bleed inside the wound. Blood turns to clot. Intraoperative patient education is one of the most important things to decrease your complication rate, whether you're doing something simple like a carpal tunnel, but especially if you're doing something complicated like a flexor tendon repair. You know, if you tell your patient exactly what to do during a flexor tendon repair, they're going to listen to you. But if nothing goes in, nothing comes out. So instead of wasting your time talking to nurses about the weather or their children or listening to music, you're focusing on the most important person in the room, and that's the patient, so that they leave completely educated. And we can do three carpal tunnels an hour, just me and one nurse. This is a resident, someone who's just learning. She's never seen a carpal tunnel before. and. You know, I, I like to let the, I inject the first three patients at 7.30 and I do my first case at eight o'clock. So by the time I do the first case, the epinephrine has had 30 minutes to work. If you give it 30 minutes to work, it bleeds less. You can do it sooner, but it's going to bleed a little more. And so it's just a matter of organizing your time. Uh, and here you see there's no transcutaneous sutures. There's good level three evidence that transcutaneous sutures cause more infections than buried monocryl sutures. She's going to get in the shower the next day. This is my first patient. She leaves. I go inject my fifth patient while the nurse brings in the second patient. I have zero turnover time. I spend zero time twiddling my thumbs, waiting for anesthesia, waiting for nurses, waiting for a patient. I don't do any of that. I operate, inject, operate, inject, operate, inject. And I go home a lot faster and I operate on a lot more patients than in the old days when I used to sit around and wait for at least half an hour for the anesthetist to put the next patient to sleep. This I've is been using buried 5 monocryl sutures for over 20 years. Patients really like not having sutures removed. Also, I'm convinced that it decreases the infection rate because you don't have that highway hole in the skin where the sutures go into the skin, where germs can swim in and eat the dead fat molecules that always happen as the scissoring of the stitch in the dermis and fat kills fat cells. These are deep to superficial, superficial to deep, so that the knot is buried. These are absorbable sutures, simple interrupted dermal sutures. You really only want dermis in these bites. You don't want any fat, if at all possible. 
Fat has no holding power and just dies. So really eat for fat and dermis. I'm looking on the other side to make sure that I don't buttonhole. And I aim for that flat part of the skin that I can see. They're not really perpendicular to the skin, maybe 45 degrees, but there you see getting a good lateral bite. You don't want a wussy lateral bite, you want a good lateral bite. I'm going in laterally there at least three or four millimeters before I go deep and exit just below the dermis. This is how I close all of my uh, wounds, whether it's uh, nerve decompression at the elbow. Uh, and this is what the monocryl bites look like with the knot deep just below the epidermis. Uh, and uh, it's the same thing that I use on the face if I'm doing skin cancers, because I do a lot of skin cancers uh, in my practice. First thing is that this hand is on strike for the next two or three days. So we've talked about that already, intraoperative education. So this is how I do an ulnar nerve. So I inject 60 milliliters of 0.5% with one in 200,000. And so I put 20 milliliters proximally, then 20 milliliters in the middle, then 20 milliliters distally. And the whiter my hair gets, the less my needle moves. If you put 20 milliliters right there, where's it gonna go? Everywhere. And then you let the patient go play on their phone or read a book or talk to their family for half an hour, 45 minutes. And then you come in and do your surgery and there's very little bleeding. I use zero cautery. I almost never use a cautery anymore because uh, all the bleeding stops. You just ignore it and let it stop. Occasionally I'll tie off a little vein, but most of the time I do nothing. We have a cautery in the minor procedure room, but we almost never use it. And we don't do these procedures in the main operating room anymore. These procedures are all done with field sterility, just like the carpal tunnel you just saw in the minor procedure room with the same infection rate. There is no less infections by doing carpal tunnels, cubital tunnels, K wires in minor procedure rooms than in the main operating room. There's been all kinds of papers written about this. There's excellent evidence about this. Um, and the nice thing about doing the ulnar nerve is you can do it with the patient on their side like this. You can do it with the patient on their side like this. There we are doing it in a minor procedure room with field sterility. Uh, with the patient on his side because he's got a sore shoulder and he can't uh, lie with his back uh, down. He's got to lie on his side, no problem. If the patients are comfortable with injection of the cubital tunnel on their abdomen, we go ahead and do their surgery on their abdomen. For people with sore shoulders, sometimes this is a good option. The other advantage of it is that the visibility of the ulnar nerve in the prone position is really excellent. We actually did this particular case in the main operating room with field sterility. In our city, we are allowed to do main operating room cases with field sterility because we have proven to our administration that this is safe. It decreases the amount of garbage and the waste and cost of healthcare. In this case, we did both the median and the ulnar nerves with wide awake local anesthesia, no tourniquet in the main operating room with field sterility. And this patient was prone because he had a hard time lying on his back but he loves to sleep on his abdomen. No problem. We can operate on you and your abdomen because there's no endotracheal tube. It's very easy to lie on your tummy for surgery if you're awake. Uh, we now have a tank, uh, nitrogen tank in our minor procedure room, and we do skin grafts 
uh, with uh, an air dermatome in our minor procedure room. I, I don't take skin grafts for small skin grafts. I do these all in the minor procedure room now with field sterility. You see, I have no gown on there. Um, just last week, this paper was published in PRS Global Open. I, I would recommend to you that you go look at it. It's the latest review of how to inject local anesthesia so your patients think that you're magical. <laughs> you don't want your patients to think you're a torturer uh, when you inject local anesthesia. And there are 14 little tips and tricks for how to decrease the pain of local anesthesia. And they are all summarized in this paper with its videos in PRS Global Open, August of 2021. It just came out last week. So if you Google my name, Wallant, PRS Global Open, uh, you'll find it. Uh, these are the different rules of how to decrease the pain of local anesthesia. Use a small needle instead of a big needle. Go find the person who orders the needles in your hospital. Uh, don't blast the local in quickly. Slow down. Buffer all of your local with bicarbonate because 1% uh, lidocaine with 1 in 100,000 epinephrine is 1,000 times more acidic than skin, than body pH. Um, and so if you put one milliliter of bicarbonate for each 10 milliliters of lidocaine with epinephrine, it hurts a lot less. Don't insert the, uh, do insert the needle perpendicular to the skin. Don't inject in the dermis, inject in the fat under the dermis. Use sensory noise, like inject in the middle of inspiration or pinch the skin into the needle instead of moving the needle into the skin. And all of these are shown with videos in the paper that I just showed you. So there are videos for every one of these steps. Blow in more than two milliliters before moving the needle at all. Never put your sharp needle anywhere that's not numb. Only reinsert needles into skin that's clearly tumescent and numb with local anesthesia. Always inject too much volume instead of not enough volume. Always ask patients for pain feedback every time and use filler cannulas for big areas and always inject from proximal to distal. This is my favorite weapon. Uh, it's a 3cc syringe with a 30 gauge half inch needle. I like to start most of my injections with this. Certainly when you do children, uh, and there's a whole lecture on how to do wall ant in children, there's a whole chapter in the wall ant book on how to inject neonates for little nubbins and how to do uh, babies and children. Uh, I always start with a 3cc syringe. Uh, and a 30 gauge needle. When I first started injecting local anesthesia, I was taught you have to do it quick so that patients don't have pain a long time. And so I was taught you go like that. And it was terrible. I hurt people a lot for the first 20 years of my practice. But 16 years ago, I learned how to inject local anesthesia so that it doesn't hurt. And this is a bad thing to do. You never have your sharp needle tip going into live nerves. Instead, you always have at least one centimeter of visible or palpable local anesthesia ahead of your needle tip. And you're feeling it with your index finger of your left hand as you advance. And always in my head, I'm thinking, blow slow before you go. Blow slow before you go. And then when I reinsert the needle, I reinsert it here 
where the skin is numb. I don't reinsert it here where the nerves are live. That way they don't feel the second poke or the third poke or the fourth poke. They only feel the first poke. And if they only feel the first poke, I score a hole in one. If they feel pain two times, I score an eagle. If they feel pain three times, I score a birdie four times. I go back to medical school. Great. So you didn't feel the sting of the needle go in. It's not hurting right now, right? No. Okay. So now blow slow before you go. Can you back up a little bit so you can see my syringe? You can see the stuff going in. Thank you. Blow slow before you go. I'm always thinking that in my head as I advance the needle tip. I always want at least a centimeter of visible or palpable local ahead of my sharp needle tip. Because if I just advance... So this video and all of, you know, are in that paper. So I'm not going to stop at all of these. We're going to move past them because uh, these are all in the Important paper that I just the told you. Is the don't move rule. If you pull back, then the needle comes out, I have to stick it in two times. If you don't move, it hurts just one time, okay? This is for decorves. For decorves, you don't inject in the sheath. That hurts a lot. You inject in the subcutaneous fat, 10 milliliters, right underneath the middle of the incision, and then go do something else for half an hour. Go inject some more carpal tunnels. Okay, so try not to move. And at the count of three, I'm gonna put the needle in, so don't move, okay? One, two, three. It's cool. I feel it, but it's tough. Sorry for the little sting there. Nothing at all. I'm surprised. Compared to what I've been putting through, like with this. So you were uh, kind of petrified of the needle, right? Yeah, no idea. Right, because you hate needles, right? Can't stand. Right. How much did this one hurt? Out of like one to ten. Yeah. Uh, point two. Okay. Like point two, not even one. Okay, good. Like really zero. I barely even felt it. Good. So uh, after you're in, don't move the needle. Let the local find its way Number into the corbin. Okay. One, two, three. Good. You hardly moved a muscle. Keep pinching so the skin. Three, just try not to move, okay? You're going to feel three little pinches, okay? One, two, three. Very good. Well, Walk away. What my dad says yeah. is always um, take a deep breath okay. and hold it for a little bit and okay. it doesn't hurt. That's a great idea. Yeah. So at the count of three, I'll tell you when to take a deep breath, okay? Okay, ready? So at the count of three, at the count of three, turn. Important rule about the freezing is. So this is de Quervé. You inject right in the middle of the incision, uh, 10 cc's, and you don't move at all. And this is pinching the skin into the needle. Instead of pushing the needle into the skin, you pinch the skin into the needle and you keep pinching until the patient tells you that the sting is all gone because the movement, the pinch, the touch, the pressure, all of these sounds drown out the sound of the pain in the patient's brain. That's what sensory noise means. And so I'm gonna put... We published this paper in 2012 uh, where 25 consecutive medical students and residents were taught how to inject local anesthesia and then scored by patients on their first carpal tunnel injection. 
75% scored a hole in one. 25%, excuse me, sorry. Hello, Dr. Lalonde here. Yeah, sorry, Shipper, I'm right in the middle of a lecture right now. So I'll I need to call you back. Okay, all right, bye-bye. Um, so anyone can give almost painless local anesthesia. If we just take a little longer to inject, and if we learn from our colleagues, the usual causes of painful local anesthesia are injecting big volumes too fast, moving the needle too fast, or not injecting enough volume. Right, so I'd like you to please score me while I put the freezing in. Because if I don't know what you're feeling, if I'm hurting you a lot, I don't know. And if I don't know, I can't get better. Yeah. So you're going to feel the first little poke probably right. when I put the freezing in. Yeah. But after that, I want you to tell me when the first sting is gone. And every time after that, I want you to tell me if you feel any more pain. Because I don't know if you don't tell me. So you're going to feel this first little poke here. So to count of three, I want you to try not to move. At the count of two, I want you to take a nice deep breath. Can you do that for me? Okay. So you're going to pinch three times. One, deep breath. Don't move. Great. Thank you so much for not moving. So is that still stinging in there? Don't feel it. You don't feel anything? No. Did it sting when the needle went in? A little wee, a little wee bit. Okay. So here's what I, and right now it's not stinging. Okay, so can you please tell me if you feel any sting at all in the next 10 minutes? So here I'm injecting the ulnar nerve and the carpal tunnel. I'm going to do both carpal tunnel and ulnar nerve. I do this all the time. I use 60 milliliters in the elbow, 20 milliliters in the hand. And we do these in the minor procedure room, not in the main operating room. The patient sits up and goes home. And I get better and better because the patients score me and the patients score my medical students or my residents if they inject the local anesthesia. This is a tendon transfer. And in this case, we're going to use a filler cannula to inject the local anesthesia. So you make a hole in the skin with a bigger needle, and then you in, insert a blunt needle tip. This is what uh, plastic surgeons and dermatologists use to inject uh, hyaluronic acid. So there's the blunt Did tip. What? Nope, I guess not. <laughs> so I put it, I made a hole with a bigger needle. Now I'm putting in this blunt tipped cannula underneath the skin. This slides through the fat and doesn't hurt at all. So when you're using a cannula, you can go where the nerves are live and you can inject a much bigger area much faster. So if I'm doing a skin graft, uh, I will use a blunt tipped cannula to inject the local anesthesia because I can inject it faster. And here is us measuring 15 millimeters of active excursion of flexor carpi ulnaris. Uh, in this case, we injected 200 mils of quarter percent lidocaine with one in 400,000 epinephrine. And we hooked that up to ECRL and tested our movement. <laughs> And that's the patient extending his wrist for the first time in two years. So if you're still hurting people with local anesthesia injection, please stop. It took me 20 years of hurting people before I learned how not to, and you're never too old to stop hurting people. Uh, this is for a neonatal nubbin. So is it 15 minutes ago, we put the freezing in. And how much did the baby cry when I did? None, not a tear. Not a tear. So we had you uh, feed the baby and it was about 
she just started maybe a minute, two minutes, and then I just pinched the finger, mm -hmm. put a 30 gauge needle in, and she's asleep now. Uh -huh. she or not yeah. really. She's almost sleeping. But, uh, freezing in right there. You put in about oh, half a CC of 1% lidocaine with 100,000 epinephrine in the little finger of it. And uh, let it work. And now the baby's finished eating. Clearly, is having the best general anesthesia in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I can do this without stimulating the baby, then the baby can come over. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just Rest on the mom's hand, huh. not the baby's hand. And I'm just going to put that thing. Just like that. I didn't notice that any kind of response whatsoever. I'm going to send that to the dog just because we're searching. And then what I'm going to do, I'm just going to colorize the base. Main reason for that is just in case we want to bleed three or four red cells. She's totally numb, didn't feel any of that. And that's the end of it. So you don't need to put children to sleep to do little nubbins. As soon as they start feeding, they fall into a trance. And when they're in the trance, you inject the local. There are two problems with Wallant. The first is the adrenaline rush. So uh, a small percentage of patients will feel shaky from the adrenaline. If you warn them before, if you say it's normal, it's temporary, and it will go away all by itself, in 15 to 20 minutes, and you're not allergic to it, then they don't get upset. If they don't know what it is, they will get upset. And the second problem is fainting. And probably 3% of patients will faint when, you, when they see the needle, or you talk about the needle, or even thinking about the needle will make some people faint. Fainting happens because there's not enough blood going to the brain. And it's also called a vasovagal attack or syncope. Physicians witness syncope only on rare occasions so that many phenomena remain unnoticed. This video demonstrates the clinical features of syncope, which we said. So this is a group of neurologists who made this video in 1994. And it's to show you the difference between fainting and seizures. So this is all about fainting. They induced fainting or vasovagal attacks in 56 healthy volunteers. And then they filmed them so you can see exactly what fainting looks like. None of these are seizures. All of these are healthy, healthy people who fainted and recovered consciousness in less than 17 seconds. Did in 56 healthy volunteers. Syncope may be safely and effectively induced by a sequence of hyperventilation while squatting, rapid rising, and a Vasalva maneuver. In order to test the responsiveness, subjects are repeatedly asked to count. Only 10% of the subjects lay motionless during syncope. So only 10% did nothing. 90% had myoclonus. Myoclonus was usually arrhythmic and multifocal. So this is what most fainters look like. They twitch. And if you don't- Sometimes only a few mild twitches appeared. If you don't know that's fainting- Occasionally, myoclonus was generalized and symmetric. Some nurses will think that's a seizure. That's not a seizure, that's fainting. And they the all- Multifocal myoclonus could manifest itself with high frequency bursts. <laughs> The eyes are usually open during syncope and often turned upward initially. 
These are all people who are fainting. These are not seizures. So when you see this, you just reassure the patient they're going to be okay. They're not having a seizure. And you tell the nurses this is not a seizure. This is just fainting. And the difference is they all recover in less than 17 seconds. And none of them have post-ictal confusion or memory loss. They remember everything right up to the time that they fainted. And their brain is totally clear at the end of a faint. After a seizure, it's not clear. Their brain is not clear. They have post-seizure fog. And seizures can last a lot more than 17 seconds. Physicians would... So uh, with seizures, they last longer. Patients are more stiff. The most powerful difference between fainting and a seizure is post-ictal confusion. Reorientation is immediate in syncope and does not exceed 30 seconds. And postictal disorientation lasting longer than 30 seconds suggests a seizure. So the best thing about fainting is to avoid it. And you avoid it by injecting all patients laying down. I do not inject patients sitting up for wall amp because not enough blood is going to the brain and more are going to faint. When they're lying down, they can still faint. And you know they're going to faint when they say, I'm not feeling very well, or I think I'm going to be sick. And as soon as they say that, I reach for underneath their knees and lift up their knees so that two liters of blood from their thighs goes to their brain. Then I take the pillow out from under their head and I put it underneath their feet. That gets more blood to the brain. And then I put the bed in Trendelenburg. This was a real event. And you'll see that I'm very practiced at doing this because this is how you abort a faint. You stop a faint from happening by doing this. So I'm going to stop the first lecture there and I'm gonna open it for discussions before we get into the second lecture, if anybody's still awake. Thanks, Professor Lalonde, for this very interesting uh, lecture and uh, these illustrative uh, videos. I believe uh, everybody uh, watching uh, got a lot of benefit from it, and uh, I myself uh, got so much uh, tips for application of the talent in many hand services. So thank you again. You're welcome. I don't know if the technical team can get rid of that high noise vibration, but if you could, that would be nice. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Sadek. I'm not hearing it now. Okay. So, so uh, I have a few questions from the attendees. Uh, for the first question, uh, how about using Wallant in hand infection? Do you have yes. precautions? Do you have precautions or uh, some tips about it? Yes, you definitely can use Wallant in hand infections, uh, but you do not inject into the area of cellulitis. You inject proximal to the area of cellulitis because if you inject where the skin is hyperemic, it's going to wash out the local. And so I get a marking pen. Let's say it's a fight bite. So I will draw my area of cellulitis and then I will inject 40 milliliters, always from proximal to distal. So 10, 10, 10, five, five. And on the other side, I'll put in 10 cc's just past the transverse carpal ligament so that I get all of the common digital nerves. And then I wait for half an hour uh, and it will work very well. The same thing for flexor synovitis, except for you only need to be on the palmar side. And I haven't taken uh, a fight bite or flexor synovitis to the main operating room for many years. I, I am on call by myself, <laughs> as you see, <laughs> without a resident a lot. And I take these patients to the emergency department myself on Friday night. 
Well, the first thing I do is inject local anesthesia proximal to the area of cellulitis. I wait at least a half an hour. During the half an hour, I get the intravenous started. I do the paperwork. I organize to admit the patient into hospital. We never go to the main operating room. And then after I drain the pus, we walk over to the sink, just as you saw me do in that video in Ghana. We wash the pus out with tap water. I irrigate with bridine. I have a 50 milliliter syringe with betadine and I flush the wound with betadine while tap water washes out the wound. And then we admit the patient to the hospital. Right. So uh, this is so much clear uh, answer for the audience. And uh, we have another, another Okay, Dr. Sedek, go ahead. Okay, so, uh, so uh, there is, there is two channels. There is, okay, carry on. <laughs> you can hear me clearly. Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. So, so in case of long bone fractures, if we use Wallant, do you believe that we have the total confidence that uh, we don't have a standby anesthetist with us? I think that in the beginning, you should have a standby anesthetist because you're doing something new. Uh, and, you know, again, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, so I'm not going to tell you how to do orthopedic surgery. I'm just showing you what other orthopedic surgeons in the world are doing. And so, you know, uh, and I know that a number of people do have their anesthesia colleagues on standby. I mean, the main thing is let's not hurt the patient, right? But there are some times where it's safer to not use general anesthesia. And in those cases, you know, you might want to start wide awake. And if, the, uh, if it's not working because you didn't inject enough volume, because it's always going to be because you didn't inject enough volume, then you can still put the patient to sleep. You know, we, we, above all, we need to look after the patients. But as you learn how to do this, it, I would start with something simple like a distal radius fracture or a scaphoid fracture or, you know, something like that. Because th those are pretty easy to do. And then after that, you can go to more complicated stuff like ankles and elbows and tibias. But uh, for uh, um, a question from me for you, uh, uh, some patients are anxious, okay? And we try to use Wallant in some of these patients. And even I'm 100% sure they don't feel anything, but they all the time are irritable. So do you use Wallant for these patients also, or do you prefer to use uh, some sort of uh, hypnotic with them? Yeah, I, I would either like to use zero sedation or general anesthesia <laughs> because a small amount of some sedation can make some patients crazy, you know, and it's not a small amount of sedation in my hands is, and even in my anesthesia colleagues' hands is often not great. They say, look, I'm just going to put them to sleep. And I say, great, put them to sleep. <laughs> You know, uh, so really, if a patient is very anxious, don't do it. Just put them to sleep. You know, as you as you get better and better, your confidence increases. 
you become more and more calm. You know, if a surgeon is very excited and there's a lot of noise all around and it's not comfortable and the, the heart machine is going beep, 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 and the nurses are yelling and it, it, it's not a good calm environment. In my environment, there's not a lot of noise. I talk to the patients. Teddy Prasetyono in Indonesia, he gets his patients to sing if they are uh, feeling anxious. It's a very interesting technique. Or he gets the nurses to sing to the patients. You know, there's lots of different ways. Some people use virtual reality cameras. Uh, in Michigan, they use that. Jinbo Tang in China has the patient look at uh, movies on uh, iPad, you know. But if you have a patient who's very, very anxious, just don't do it. Don't start with that patient. Okay. So another question. Uh, in case uh, if there is uh, so much bleeding after application of Wallen, What's your tips to decrease uh, or to increase hemostasis? Do you prefer to uh, increase the dose of the adrenaline or epinephrine? Yeah, it, too much bleeding uh, it just doesn't happen. Uh, not with me. I think most of the bleeding happens because you inject and cut. If you inject and cut and don't wait at all, it's going to bleed more. If you wait half an hour, it's gonna bleed less and less and less. And if you wait one hour, it's hardly gonna bleed at all. So bleeding is just not a big problem in my practice for 36 years. Uh, but I know that a lot of people are impatient just because of the way they, they don't inject two or three patients and then operate. They inject one patient, operate. Inject the next patient, operate, because that's what they've always done. <laughs> So you just tell the patients, you come early, we're going to inject you. This is like baking a cake. We're going to wait at least a half an hour before your surgery. Or this is like going to catch a plane at the airport. You're not going to get there and get on the plane. You're going to get there and you're going to wait for a while and then you're going to get on the plane. So you're going to get to the hospital. We're going to inject your local anesthesia. You're going to wait at least half an hour to an hour, and then we're going to do your surgery. We're going to make sure that the local anesthesia works very well so that it doesn't hurt at all. So you bring a phone, bring a book, and entertain yourself for a while. And if you do that, it doesn't bleed. And if it, if it does bleed a lot and it bleeds too much, then cover the wound, take the patient to the operating room, put the tourniquet on, put the patient to sleep and do what we always used to do. Okay. So another question, uh, if you uh, 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 did the uh, diluted or used a diluted solution for the lungs, okay, do you believe uh, or do you think this uh, might affect the uh, efficacy of the anesthesia? Yeah, so if you use one quarter percent lidocaine with one in 400,000 epinephrine, it still works extremely well for three hours. But one in 400,000 epinephrine is going to bleed a little more than one in 100,000 epinephrine. It's still not enough blood to stop you from doing what you're doing. You can still do what you need to do and you can see well. But this whole business of operating in a sea of ink is not true, okay? You're not operating in a sea of ink. I mean, all orthopedic surgeons know you can do a total hip without a tourniquet. All head and neck cancer surgeons know you can take out a tongue and a mandible without putting a tourniquet on the neck. <laughs> you know, we can tolerate a little bit of bleeding, okay? So it's just not that big an issue if it bleeds a little more. And one quarter percent lidocaine with one in 400,000 epinephrine is just as effective as 1% lidocaine, as long as there are lidocaine molecules everywhere you're gonna cut, the nerves are not working. 
It doesn't matter how many lidocaine molecules there are. It matters that every nerve is knocked out with lidocaine. Okay. Uh, so uh, another question: uh, We uh, you use the divalent uh, during the incisions in cases of uh, hand surgery and uh, the cases you demonstrated. Uh, but do you believe divalent is effective during the traction, uh, like in wrist scope, as you uh, demonstrated with Elizabeth Hager uh, in doing wrist uh, wrist arthroscopy? Do you think that divalent is enough for uh, tolerating the traction effect? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I have to disclose that I don't do wrist arthroscopy in my practice. So the truth is, I don't know, but I am told by a lot of surgeons, and I know a lot of surgeons who do wrist arthroscopy with Wallant, that it is 100% effective. Uh, even the traction part. Sometimes though, Uh, you can have pain in and around the elbow if you're, you know, doing traction on the fingers. I understand. <laughs> Again, I don't do this, so I don't know. So you have to make sure that the elbow is in a comfortable position. I've heard orthopedic surgeons say that when they talk about uh, this. And the fingers may not be completely numb. So the traction devices on the fingers may be uncomfortable in some cases. I don't really understand that. I don't know how to fix it. I don't know if they do median nerve blocks. I don't think so. I don't think they're blocking the median and ulnar nerve every time they do this. Uh, and so I'm afraid that I just cannot answer that question honestly well, because I don't do that in my practice. So another uh, question, uh, uh, you prefer to use uh, steroids or antihistaminic uh, in cases of adrenaline rush in some cases? I do not. Uh, I don't use steroids. I don't use antihistamines. I just, I think the most important thing about the adrenaline rush is to explain to people that it's normal. You know, I, I don't know about in Egypt, but in Canada, we have a lot of patients who think that they're allergic to local anesthesia because they went to the dentist and they got an adrenaline rush. And when you ask them, oh, why do you think you're allergic? Oh, because after they put in the local anesthesia, I was like this, you know, and okay. That's adrenaline. It's a normal reaction. You're not allergic to it. Uh, it's a little bit like you've had way too much coffee, right? And they go, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like that, yeah. And, and you just say it will go away all by itself in 15 or 20 minutes, you know. And, and again, a calm attitude and just, you know, reassurance, this is fine, you're going to be okay. All that goes a long way to solving the adrenaline rush problem. But most people, if you warn them, they're fine. But if they don't know, <laughs> it can be a problem. So I warn every patient every time I inject local anesthesia, you may get a little adrenaline rush. If you do, it's normal. It's not an allergy. It will go away all by itself in 15 or 20 minutes. It can just be a little scary. It's not your nerves. Blame it on me. It's my fault. Okay. So the last question I have now, uh... Do you use the rule of 50s for the safety of local anesthesia when you prepare your uh, uh, injection? Do, do I use what? The rule of 50s. The I rule of 50s? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I don't understand this, but, uh, but the question is I literally... Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I understand it. The rule of 50 is that I don't use more than 50 cc's of lidocaine uh, with epinephrine. So in general, the answer is yes, I do follow the rule of 50. The occasional time, have I given more than seven milligrams per kilogram or 50 milliliters of 1% lidocaine with one in 100,000? I have, because I know that it's safe but I don't do it all the time. And I think if you really want to be safe, especially when you start using this, 
If you follow the rule of 50, no more than 50 milliliters of 1% lidocaine with one in 100,000 epinephrine, that's seven milligrams per kilogram, it's ridiculously safe, <laughs> but you're never going to feel sorry that you were too safe. Okay. So uh, that's uh, the end of the uh, questions. Uh, and uh, I believe this is the uh, end of the first half of the uh, this evening uh, uh, lectures. And now uh, Professor uh, Mohammed Mustafa Kod will take over and join you with the uh, moderate the second half. Fantastic. Good evening, Dr. Kolb, and thank you so much, Dr. Sadek. Good evening, Dr. Kolb. Good evening, uh, Professor Lalun. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, moderate uh, this lecture for you. Uh, I have met, uh, I was lucky to meet uh, you two times in 2017 in Hawaii and in San Diego, and I enjoyed uh, a very nice workshop, and uh, I have uh, attended also the lecture, uh, your uh, student have uh, won the prize for uh, making less consumption of money for the country uh, by using Wallant. Uh, he gave a talk and he won a prize from the government, uh, as I remember, uh, 2017. Uh, I enjoyed uh, a lot of uh, clinical tips and tricks from your procedures and uh, from uh, your case, yourself, uh, of carpal tunnel and uh, being uh, anterior interosseous nerve and not a carpal tunnel, and was released by your uh, student, female student, as I remember, from Brazil. Uh, I enjoyed a lot of procedures, and uh, you uh, make me courage to do a lot of procedures under uh, Wallen, and still I'm learning from you, of course. So it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce you uh, tonight. And uh, I'm sure we will uh, all enjoy and learn from you more and more. So please go on. Thank you so much, Professor Colbin. And it's been so nice to meet you and all of your colleagues from Egypt. Egypt. I really do enjoy meeting you all. And uh, maybe someday we'll do it in person. Uh, but thank you for your very kind words. We all learn from each other, that's for sure. So I will share my screen and start up my second lecture. And the other thing that I just uh, need to do for one second is to let my dog leave the room. <laughs> there you go. my dog and make sure that I'm okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, finger fractures and how to try to get better results with finger fractures. What we teach our residents are five uh, important principles of finger fractures to get less stiffness, because the biggest problem with finger fractures is stiffness. And the first principle is do as little dissection as possible to solve the problem. And so when you can do closed reduction with percutaneous K-wires, it's a good thing to do. The next thing is early controlled movement in closed K-wired finger fractures is as important as early controlled movement in flexor tendon injuries. The third thing is get patients off pain medicine as soon as possible and listen to your body. Don't do what hurts. Pain guided healing, common sense. And the fourth thing is treat to get great movement, not to get great x-rays. Don't treat x-rays, treat patients. And the fifth one is this. When patients come in looking like this, if this patient has a hand fracture and he comes in looking like this, like the spiral metacarpal fracture I saw at the hospital this morning, that's what he looked like when I met him. For God's sake, don't screw it up with surgery <laughs> because this is the goal. The goal is to restore hands that look like this. This is a good result. A good x-ray is not a good result. Good movement is a good result. Let's talk about what we're going to do for the next uh, three weeks, okay? Slowly this time. 
a straight note. Beautiful, and it's not going anywhere, so that's good. Does it look crooked to you? I can see better if I sat up. Yeah, go ahead, sit up. Yeah. Do that little bit. Yeah. Okay, that, and that's it. You only take it to pain, never past pain. So this patient is four weeks after K-wire surgery. We removed his K-wires at three weeks. And what I'd like to do is take you through each one of those steps one at a time. So at the count of three, try not to move. At the count of two, take a nice deep breath, okay? Okay. One, deep breath, don't move. Good. So I used a 3cc syringe on a 30 gauge needle to start, and I put my first 3cc's in. Then I put more on the palm, then I put more on the dorsum, uh, and then I let it work for a while. And here's his pre-op x-ray, and we're going to do uh, K-wire fixation. So let's talk about what we're gonna do for the next uh, three weeks. Okay. Um, today, this hand is on strike. What I mean by that is no walking around like this and none of this. Because both those what? things. Yes, sir. Because both those things cause bleeding in here. And if you bleed in here, it causes more scarring and more bone formation. The biggest problem with these is not that they heal. They all heal. The biggest problem is they get stiff. Can you lift your hand right off the bed? Right, just leave it right there. The biggest problem is they get stiff. And so what we're going to do is we're going to treat you so that it heals, but you're not going to get stiff. And you're going to be able to get back and have your life as soon as possible. Okay? So this hand is on strike for the next two or three days until you totally get off all painkillers. What do you normally take for pain? Advil, Tylenol, nothing? Oh, just when I feel some discomfort, just to my broken on the way to go. Ibuprofen. Okay, so when the freezing comes out of here in five hours, you can go ahead and take 800 of ibuprofen if you need that much. Now you start with, start with 400, then if you need another 400, you take it. Or you can take it by 200s if you want. Keep your hand up, don't put it down and touch that place while we keep talking, okay? All right, so it's okay to take Advil, ibuprofen for a day or two, but this hand is up is on, and on strike. So by tomorrow or the next day, the sting of the break and the pen is gonna be gone. And you're gonna get into the pain of, gee doctor, now it only hurts when I put my hand down. That's when you quit taking the ibuprofen, listen to your body and don't do the stuff that hurts. We didn't spend 2 billion years of all in pain because it's bad for us. It's nature's only way for your body to talk to you and say, hey, would you quit that? I'm trying to heal in here and you're screwing it up, stop that. And that's a little voice in your head you can't hear with that going here. It's probably the way it's going in place because I don't stop. <laughs> ah, okay, well, there you go. So um, that's what, so I just want you to understand that intraoperative education. Oh yeah, see, look at that. That's perfect. That's great. That's perfect. We can shoot, um, shoot Amanda. Now we need you to uh, flex a little bit. Go ahead, flex your fingers, bring it in, all the way in. And straighten out. So that's pretty good. So another pin and it's gonna be great. Okay, so when I say go, I want you to do this. Oh, we're just getting a small motion. And then we're gonna do this again. We're gonna do it two times, okay? Okay, so go ahead and do it now. Right. Swing around and then shoot that and do it a little bit more slowly this time. And straighten out. Beautiful. And it's not going anywhere. So that's good. So here's the thing. If, if you see the patient do a full fist flexion, full extension with two K wires in, 
and you see that the reduction doesn't go away, then you know you're going to be okay. And that's not a perfect reduction. My resident did that, very good resident, but the reduction is not perfect. But the finger is hardly crooked at all. It, it's just a little, little bit crooked. And the patient is going to tell us that in the next video. Not enough that I want to open it, though. Remember I said you don't treat x-rays, you treat movement. His movement was great. The x-ray is not perfect. I'm not going to open this to get a perfect x-ray. When I say go, I want you to bring in your hand, but have a look at it and tell me if it's crooked or not. Okay. So slowly bring it in. Does it look crooked to you? I can see better if I sat up. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, sit up. Yeah. And open it up. It actually looks better, a lot better than what it was, because before I could definitely see that it was crooked. Yeah. See, you can tell if it's crooked better than I can. You've been looking at this thing for at least 20 years. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and it's not looking crooked either. It looks a little bit, but it's a lot better than what it was. Yeah. And had we left it, yeah, probably. Right. Okay, so a little bit crooked it looks to you. And bring it in. And when you bring it in, look at that. Does that look crooked to you? That oh, looks good. Okay, and straighten it out again. Beautiful. And we're just going to shoot the x-ray there and make sure that that's still good. Yep, it's not going anywhere. And you can see why it's a little bit crooked, because it's not actually 100% perfect, but it doesn't have to be. It just has to be very close because, like you said, you can live with it. If something is just a little bit off, you can live with that. Does that make sense to you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Good. Okay. On Friday, we're going to start what's called early protected movement with pain guided healing. So, what that means is that, Amanda, you're going to have zero Advil, zero Tylenol, and you're going to move it just a little bit so it doesn't get stuck. If you move it this much, that's enough tendon gliding that you're not gonna get stuck. If you don't move it at all, everything in there turns to like jello with fruit in it. Like everything gets stuck to everything else. You'd like the tendons to keep moving, but you'd like the bone to stay together. If you don't do what hurts, the bone will stay together. When it starts to hurt, it's because the bone's coming apart. It's gonna talk to you. It's going to tell you. Okay. And so if you just move the last joint a little bit and even the middle joint, you can move that as long as it doesn't hurt. Pain guided healing. If it hurts, you can't do it. If it doesn't hurt, you can't do it. Does that make sense? Thanks, fellas. Perfect. And we're going to do that starting on Friday. But between now and then, what are you going to do? Tell me what you're going to do. Just keep my hand up. Right. Don't move it. Right. No walking around like this and none of this. All right. All right, great. <laughs> if patients don't do what hurts, they will not get infection around their K wires. Let me say that again. If patients don't do what hurts, they will not get infection around their K wires. To move it just a little bit, the fracture will not come apart and they will not get infection around their K wires if they don't do what hurts. If they take painkillers, if they're drug addicts and do things that hurt, it's not going to work. Being able Great. to get out of the cast has been nice. Yeah. So, four days in this splint and uh, took Advil uh, maybe six times. And now we're going to start pain guided movement and pain guided therapy. It does feel good, doesn't it? So you can wiggle your little finger as long as it doesn't hurt. I've been doing it all week. Good. A little bit inside, <laughs> just right? Just a little bit inside the cast. Yeah, just like I asked you to. I told him he could wiggle it a little bit inside the cast. And he hasn't had any Advil since yesterday morning. There's no, no Advil on board right now, so we can start moving it a little bit. And uh, you can tell that he's had his hand up the whole time and he's listened, even though he's been working because it's not swollen, it's like a report card. So I know that he's a good patient. He's gonna do everything I ask him to do. So at this point, what I want you to do is just put your finger right there, right? 
hold it like hold it like that on either side uh the other way yeah right and just wiggle the tip a little bit till it that doesn't hurt no okay so well, here's look at the entry too you can see that i've broken the top of this before yeah right but do so, so do that again but this time just hold it yeah don't do what hurts now back like you were doing just pull it in a little bit and hold and count to 10 this time don't just wiggle it All right what you do is you take it to pain but not past pain and hold it and count to 10 and you do that at least 10 times a day and then move it down and do it to the next knuckle now the next knuckle you're not going to be able to move as much because it's going to be sore but just a little bit yeah. that then don't do it then back well, I, can, I can i can do that a little bit yeah okay that and that's it you only take it to pain never past pain. Does that make sense to you? Yep. Beautiful. That's called pain guided healing, pain guided therapy. So you see the blue ink on the back of the finger that was to help my resident where to put the K wire. So what we do is we put the hand on the x-ray machine. We put a K wire over top of the finger and it, it shows him exactly where he has to put it so that he can get it in the right place. And then he aims for the line with, uh, with his K wire when he goes to put it in. And sometimes you can help a resident put in a K wire by using a 14 gauge needle and using the 14 gauge needle as a guide for the K wire. So the 14 gauge needle bites onto the bone so it doesn't move. And then you pass the K-wire through the 14-gauge needle. So those are little tricks to help residents learn how to put in K-wires. two weeks from the pinning of the fracture. And boy, that's looking pretty good. Does that hurt to do that? Yeah, a little discomfort, but not bad. Right. We want you to take it to pain, but not past pain, right? Good. So you got that. And you're totally <laughs> off all painkillers and stuff. I haven't taken anything. Right, 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 right. The day we took you out of your cast and put you into this splint that you now take off and on, right? Yes. You take it off to get in the shower. Just put it on so we can see what it looks like. Fantastic. And can you move your finger inside it? Yep. Does that hurt at all? No, nope. actually it's helping. Good. Because of this being cut away. Yeah. I can get some movement out of it. Fantastic. So you can see that at two weeks, he's already moving pretty well. The K wires are still there, but it still hurts when I press on the fracture. So we did not pull the K wires today. We waited another week. So here's how you tell if it's healed. Let's see your other hand, right? And just put both your elbows on the table like your grandmother told you not to. This is the broken hand. This is the non-broken hand. And the bone is broken here in this bone here yes. so this is your good bone now if i press real hard on that i'm pushing pretty hard right yep. yeah and that doesn't hurt it just feels like i barely feel like yeah right when you can do that here and it's not hurting at all you are healed until then you are healing does that make sense yep. and right now i'll bet if you push there it hurts a little bit right a little bit but not a lot not a lot. And it's only two weeks. And so how many weeks is it from the fracture? Three. Three weeks from the fracture. So that makes sense. And you're not a smoker, right? No. So, so things heal quicker. So while you are healing, you probably want protection with this thing. Once you are healed, you probably don't need protection from that thing. No. Right. I'm so, taking this off more and more, to be honest with you. Oh, okay. Just so I can get more more movement. More movement in it. Right. So let's let's see how sore that is. How sore is that one? I'm it's a little bit harder. Like it feels tender, but it's not too bad. Right. So that's pretty solid then, eh? Yeah. Right. And then let's look at the scissoring business. So because you're the one who told me that it was looking pretty straight, then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good. And now make a fist as best you can. Right. And when you do that, do you think it's curling crooked or do you think it's curling straight? It's curling like it used to. 
like it used to. Yeah. Okay, and straighten it and bring it in again. That's fantastic for three weeks after injury and two weeks after uh, pain. I'm, I'm delighted with that. So that's at two weeks. We decided to wait another week. Okay, go ahead and show me a fist and straighten out. Fantastic, do it again. We had a mallet before of that little finger that's been like that forever. And turn it the other way and show me, right? Beautiful. And we're one week after pin removal, four weeks after surgery. Uh, and your finger doesn't look crooked to you? No, it's great. Here, just a second. I'm, I'm just going to take out this. There we go. Sorry about that. Let's do that again. Okay. Go ahead and show me a fist and straighten out. Fantastic. Do it again. We had a mallet before of that little finger that's been like that forever. And turn it the other way and show me. Right? Beautiful. And we're one week after pin removal, four weeks after surgery. Uh, and your finger doesn't look crooked to you? No, it's great. Okay. It looks fantastic. Good. Wonderful. And it is fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you Thank for you. doing everything. <laughs> so we've been doing this for many years. Early Go ahead. So we've been doing this for many years. Um, we've been doing early protected movement. And, you know, this morning I saw three people with metacarpal fractures. So I press on their normal bone and I say, when your broken bone feels like this, you don't need the splint anymore. And we give them a removable splint that they can take off and put on to give them protection if they think they need it. And I don't even see them again most of the time. I give them my card. I say, please call me if you have any trouble. And they don't have any trouble. But it's all about don't do what hurts. Listen to your body. We didn't spend 2 billion years evolving pain because it's bad for us. It's nature's only way for your body to say to you, stop that. I'm not ready to do that. I'm not healed enough. And if you give that simple advice to people, they do very well. And most of them don't need surgery for simple metacarpal fractures. So I literally say this to every patient, your pain is your body's only way to say to you, hey, would you quit that? I'm trying to heal in here and you're screwing it up. And you can't hear that little voice in your head with Advil in your ears. So listen to your body, don't do what hurts, and that will stop you from losing your fracture reduction. And it will stop you from getting infections around your K-wires. Four, uh, four days ago, we put freezing in your finger and uh, put pins in. How sore was the freezing? Um, it wasn't too bad. No. Huh? Then we put K-wires in your finger and you've been keeping your hand up. Now today, are you on Advil or Tylenol no. or nothing? Nothing. Perfect. Most important rule here is you can't do what hurts. Okay. So here's what I want you to do. And I'm just going to do this so the camera can see it. You can stabilize the sore part with your other hand right up to here. Cause there's, there's no pin in this bone. There's a pin in this bone. There's no pin in this bone. So you can just hold the middle bone and just do that. Try to do that. Just try to, yeah, just bend it a little bit, right? Does that hurt? No. Good. That's the key. See, you don't need to move it much. You just need to move it about that much. And the tendons are gliding so they don't get stuck. We just don't want your tendons to get stuck. And, and that's all you need to do. So what we're going to do is get you to do that at least 10 times a day. You're going to have a little splint on. You're going to wear it most of the time. Okay. to remind you that you can't do stuff right. and you're not using your hand you're just moving it just to do that and as long as you're not on Advil Tylenol so if you have a party last night you've got a headache and you're on Advil you're not moving your hand okay it's, it's just all about listening to the pain the fist was that angle on a 39 year old beautiful so that was and straight now so what you're on like the beautiful, beautiful. So there she is at the final result at two months. We took the pins out at three and a half weeks and we started early protected movement 
uh, with K wires four days after surgery. I could show you a hundred of these. I'll just show you a couple more though, because I think it's important. And in this case, I put in a third K wire because after two K wires, it moves. Straighten. Straighten. Now, is that hurting at all? Uh, not really. It's a little pull. A little pull. Pulling's okay. Hurting's not okay. And um, how sore has was it last night? Uh, last night it was the easiest night. It wasn't sore at all. Okay, that's more at the beginning. Right. And how long ago did we do this? Four days ago. Uh, yeah. Four days Five ago. Days. Oh. Uh, let's do that one more time. If I press right there, does that hurt? No, just like the top of my finger. It feels funny up in right the back here. here. Yeah. But it doesn't hurt right where the bone is broken, right no. down here, does it? I'll press no, it again. Does that hurt? No. No. Okay, good. So we pulled her K wires out at two and a half weeks. And there she is at four weeks after the K wire. And we see this a lot. You saw that in the first patient at four weeks. And when I was a kid, when I was a young surgeon, I was taught to put these patients in jail for three weeks <laughs> in a cast. And they were so stiff. And when I started my practice, that's what we did. But very soon after I started my practice, certainly in the 1990s, we stopped immobilizing finger fractures and started early protected movement. And the results are so much better, just like in flexor tendon repair. So in this case, we had three fingers that were fractured. Two of them needed K wires. So I put uh, uh, 10 or 20 cc's in the palm, and then we K wired one finger and tested the stability. And then we K-wired the other finger and tested the stability. And just like flexor tendon repair, we do full fist flexion and extension testing. Because if they can do a full fist and it doesn't come apart on Friday, I know that on Monday I can do half a fist and it's not going to come apart, just like in flexor tendon repairs. So here he is at the end of the surgery on Friday uh, morning. And here he comes back on Monday morning, no Advil, no Tylenol. You can see that he's kept his hand higher than his heart because it's not swollen at all. And the therapist starts early protected movement, just like you saw me do. Our therapists uh, teach the patients about early protected movement and they build them protective splints, just like for flexor tendon repairs. And then here he is, uh, with his result, I think this is about uh, six weeks. And three fingers, broken bones, and they all did well. So the co most common complication related to broken fingers is stiffness. It's not malunion or non-union. It's stiffness. And what we need to do is to keep them moving just like flexor tendons so they don't get stiff. And you only need about 30 degrees of IP joint movement. You just need a little bit, like uh, just enough so that the tendon doesn't get stuck. And so if you are not sending your K-wired finger fractures to your therapists, please do. Uh, and just tell them the simple rule. They can move it, but they can't use it, just like a flexor tendon repair. They keep their hand higher than their heart for the first three to five days. Why? Because if you move right away, it's the same as a flexor tendon or a tenolysis. It bleeds inside. Blood inside turns to scar and callus. If you keep it up quiet like a sleeping baby, it doesn't bleed inside. You don't get that extra blood in there that starts to turn to callus or scar. And also remember that collagen formation doesn't start until day three. And so you don't need to start moving immediately. You keep your hand higher than your heart until you get off all painkillers, let the swelling come down, let the work of flexion come down, let the internal bleeding stop. You have three to five days before collagen formation starts. And then when they come in, then you start with pain guided movement, just like for flexor tendons. So this is an older gentleman 
who's got a fracture and we K wired his fracture. Uh, and uh, we do full fist flexion and extension testing. And here he is three days later, we start early protected movement in a little splint, take it to pain, but not past pain, just like all the other patients that you just saw. And even with older patients, like this gentleman in his 60s, where it counts even more, they don't get stiff. And straighten. Lovely. Does that hurt? Uh, it's, it's getting to the point where it hurts, yeah. I push it to that point, but I don't push it beyond that. Perfect. Yeah, that's exactly what I want to hear. And in his case, when I press on the fracture at two and a half weeks, it doesn't hurt anymore. That's when I pull the pins out. Clinical healing is when you press on a fracture and there's no pain to firm palpation. This is much more accurate than x-ray healing for finger fractures. X-ray healing for finger fractures is useless. Let me say that again. X-ray healing for finger fractures is useless. Clinical healing, when you do firm palpation to the fracture site and it doesn't hurt anymore, then you can pull the K-wires. So we pulled his K-wires at two and a half weeks and you saw his final result at four months. So uh, this is clinical healing. If you press firmly on the fracture site and there's no pain, then you know that the fracture is healed regardless of what the radiologist says. The radiologist will say, it's not healed yet. I don't believe him. I don't even listen to what he says. I could care less. You know, when I was a young surgeon, we used to immobilize hand fractures for four to six weeks and wait until they were healed on x-ray. But radiological healing of hand fractures is useless. And a lot of times, you, if you operate at three weeks, the bones are solid, even though the radiologist says it's not united. And that gave us years of stiff fingers. And it's still that way for a number of surgeons. So you know your fractures heal when it doesn't hurt anymore when you press on it firmly. That's when you pull out your K-wires. It's not always wait four weeks. It's when it's healed. So this lady came to me with a malunion of her finger at three months old. It was crooked. It was uh, pain-free. And when I pressed on the fracture, it didn't hurt at all. And look at the bad scissoring. It's the ring finger. And the radiology report said, osseous union not complete. <laughs> I just laughed because <laughs> I know that's ridiculous. So it was, it was rock in there. So I did an osteotomy uh, with Wallant, K-wired it, early protected movement. It's still not perfect at one year post-op, but it's coming and it's way better than it was. And at least it's not scissoring anymore. And she's going to continue to work at it. But, you know, we started behind the eight ball. We started with an old malunited fracture here. So this is a pretty good result for an old malunited fracture. In dorsal dislocations, I like to use these dorsal blocking K wires, and it stops the uh, middle phalanx from subluxating dorsally. And in this case, it was two weeks old. And yet I pushed that fracture down into reduction. We started early protected movement at four days uh, after the uh, K wiring. There you see me putting in the K wires. You see me testing the movement during surgery. You see me starting early protected movement at four days with pain guided hand therapy. And you see the final result. Uh, in this one is a middle phalanx fracture with rotation, but we do exactly the same thing. Field sterility in a minor procedure room. None of these cases went to the main operating room. Not one of these cases went to the main operating room. Even the osteotomy. I did that in a minor procedure room outside the main operating room. 
We removed the K-wires at two weeks when the fracture was no longer sore to palpation. So in this case, we took out the K-wires at two weeks because she was healed. And there she is at six months after surgery. There are two kinds of pain with any broken bone or any operation. There's the pain of the cut or the break that lasts a day or two. And it's okay to take painkillers for that, but you keep it elevated and you don't move it at all until you're off all painkillers. And then there's the pain of, gee, doctor, now it only hurts when I put my hand down or when I do stuff. That starts at two to three days after surgery. That's after any operation including my back surgeries, my carpal tunnels. I've had these operations. I follow these rules and I quit all painkillers at two or three days. And then I just listen to my pain and it stops me from getting into complications and problems. So I know that a lot of people love plates and screws. And so uh, I started plates and screws with hand and finger fractures early in my career as a surgeon. And then I stopped like many very good hand surgeons like Peter Stern. He also started plates and screws when they came out in the 1980s for hand and finger fractures. And both of us stopped because plates and screws, especially in finger fractures, they occupy space especially the plates, not so much the screws or especially buried cannulated screws with minimal surgery. Those are the best. But the more dissection you have, the bigger the plate, the more you have scar over the plate. Sometimes the scar is two to three millimeters thick and the tendons have to bowstring over the scar. So there's the scar and there's the tendon bowstringing over the scar over the plate. It's really hard for tendons to do that. And the other problem is that with all the dissection, everywhere you dissect, that space is filled with blood. What happens to blood between periosteum and bone? It turns to callus. And that callus seizes tendons and joints. And so, um, a very common, so I try to not open fractures that I can do closed. And anything that I can do with K-wires, I do, because there's less space that's filled with blood that turns into scar and callus. So here's a common problem after a finger fracture is PIP extensor lag. So this patient can't straighten out the finger any more than that. And it was a distal phalanx fracture. And this is a common problem. They can't straighten out their PIP joint and it has an easy solution. It's called a relative motion flexion splint. So the first thing I do is I do a pencil test and I put the pencil like this in her fingers. And I say, now, does that improve the pain in your finger? And she says, yes. And it also forces the PIP joint to go straight. And so she wore that for a month and it totally fixed her extensor leg. So three months ago, we had a crush injury of the distal phalanx of this finger. And the, I saw the patient a month after, or two months after that, and she couldn't extend the finger. Show me in your other hand how much you could extend. It was like that. It was like that. Couldn't extend yeah. it any more than that. And that's when I met her a month ago. And so we put her in this relative motion flexion splint, which forced extension of the uh, PIP joint. And the problem was that for two months, she was walking around like this, ignoring the finger and then couldn't extend it because of hyperextension of the MP joint and just ignoring it. So this forced her to use the finger again. It forced it to extend. And she's been wearing it 24 seven for a month. And the other thing you just told me is that within two hours of putting the splint on your finger felt better. Mm -hmm. The swelling was better. And I couldn't believe it. How fast. Yeah. Yeah. So like just two hours and then the swelling got all better. Yeah. Right. So take your splint off now, please. And just show me uh, your full extension. So you got all your extension back. So for extensor leg after finger fractures, work with your hand therapists and get them to do relative motion flexion splitting.
Yeah, this is the image I was looking for. Okay, if you have a PIP joint fracture, this is so much fun to do as a surgeon. You make that incision, you go in, you can see the fracture beautifully. You put in your K-wires or your screw or whatever you want to do. But all of this space fills with blood. And all of that blood turns to callus and scar. So this patient, just because you were in there, just because you cut it open and looked in there to satisfy your curiosity, to make it perfect, to make a perfect x-ray, you're condemning this patient for at least two more months of stiffness, just because you were there. If you don't go there, <coughs> they're not going to have all that blood in there turn to callus and scar. And that's why most white haired surgeons stop using plates and either do closed pinning with K wires or now the latest rage is the percutaneous screw through the joints, either the MP joint or the PIP joint. I haven't started doing that. I'm waiting to see if there's long-term arthritis from going through the PIP joint before I start doing that. So here's an example of you don't treat an x-ray, you treat a patient. So in this case, you think, oh, I got to open this because this is awful. This is a two week old injury in a young person. And I just did it with Wallet. I pushed and pushed and pushed until I reduced this. Then I K wired it. And my x ray is not perfect. See that? But on the table, the movement was perfect. So I treat for movement, not for x-ray. My goal is not to get a perfect x-ray. My goal is to get fingers that do that when they move. So I will accept a less than perfect x-ray before I will open a fracture like that. Because with wall ant on the table, I can see that they have full fist flexion and extension. And if they have full fist flexion and extension on the operating table, they're going to get full fist flexion and extension later. I want to show you another example of one of those. Here's an x-ray that's not perfect after K-wiring. I don't care if the x-ray is not perfect. I care that his finger looks like this when he flexes it. And I care that his finger completely extends when he extends it. Here's another one. Not a perfect x-ray, but, well, here we go, sorry. I think we're gonna start it there or not. I have to take it off full screen for just a second, guys. There we go, sorry. Look at the movement. He had great movement on the operating table, not a great x-ray, but, there's his post-op movement. So I don't care if the x-ray is not perfect. That joint is almost perfect, not quite, almost perfect. I'll accept that. So I know that a lot of you open these. And when I was a young surgeon, I used to open all of these because I was taught that if you don't open them, they're gonna have weakness and shortness. Those were the excuses for operating. The real reason is because it's fun and we want to make a pretty looking x-ray. But I don't operate on these anymore. I didn't operate on this person. There's his post-fracture result. Pretty good, eh? No surgery. If they're not scissoring, I don't operate on them. Here's four more. They weren't scissoring. I didn't operate on them. We published a paper seven years ago where we found these patients much later. And guess what? The hand therapists who measured their power found that both hands had the same power. So you're not operating on them to improve power. They do have a little bit of shortness, but they have the same power late after the fracture if you can find them and measure them. And so you're not operating on them to improve power. You're not operating on them to improve function. You're operating on them to improve the x-ray. I've had two patients have complex regional pain syndrome after other surgeons put screws in these things. 
Um, you know, surgery is not benign. And so uh, I almost never operate on spiral metacarpals anymore. In fact, I saw two this morning that I did not operate on. I said, have a nice day, because neither of them had clinically significant scissoring. So I check them for scissoring. If it's scissoring, I do a closed reduction with a K-wire or I might open it up and put screws. If it's not scissoring, then I'll splint for a week and recheck. If it's still not scissoring, have a great day with pain guided movement and healing. The, this uh, is the same patient. This is before treatment and this is with no treatment. So. It's 11 years later, this guy just happened to come in for another problem and I re-x-rayed his hand. He said, yeah, doctor, you saw me 11 years ago and you said, that's gonna heal just fine. And you said, this bump is gonna go away. And you said that my hand is gonna look just like my other hand. And guess what? The bump went away. His hand looks just like the other hand. And I did zero treatment, just pain guided healing. Don't do what hurts, a little splint for a while. Bones remodel, don't treat x-rays, treat hands. And I, th I think I'm, Dr. Sadek, how am I doing for time? Am I out of time? Dr. Sadek, am I Not out yet. of time? Not yet, take, take your time, Professor. Okay. Sorry, I, I don't want to be unrespectful, and I'm just not sure if I'm out of time. So anyway, uh, with a Bennett's fracture, almost always we do not have to open these. Uh, this one also has a piece of trapezium off it. And so what I do is I inject the whole radial side of the hand so that I can put K-wires everywhere that I need to, and it doesn't hurt. And I let it work for at least a half an hour, and I see other patients and then I come back and this is what I do. So I distract, I pull out on the thumb, I adduct the base, I push on the thumb to get the thumb reduced. And then I pronate the thumb. That's the most important uh, part because the dorsal ligament complex reduces the joint. So you pronate the thumb and you get a perfect uh, reduction. And then you just fire the K-wire, you know, and in my hands, I can do this almost every time. I, I just don't need to open these hardly ever. And so there's that patient who had the uh, fracture of both the trapezium and the uh, metacarpal base. And there's his eight weeks after surgery. And we did him in the clinic too, in the minor procedure room, never went to the main operating room. So the take home points, never open a fracture that you can treat closed. Unstable PIP fractures, let them get sticky uh, for 10 to 14 days and then do pain guided therapy. K wires will not get infected if patients don't do what hurts and are off all painkillers. And you certainly don't use narcotics for these. I'm sure that in Egypt, you don't. That's North American disease. And just don't let your tendons and joints get stuck in collagen. Start moving on day three. Um, I'd like to just share another thing with you. And this is uh, patients who have uh, pain in their hands. So people come in all the time to see us as hand surgeons, and they say, Doctor, I got a pain in my hand and I've had it for a long time. And you look at the x-rays and the x-rays are normal. And so instead of doing nothing, just take out your pencil and see what happens when you do the pencil test. And if you Google Lalonde and pencil test, you'll get this paper again in PRS Global Open. It's free. It's got all kinds of videos to explain to you and your therapist how to do the pencil test and how to solve pain and stiffness problems in the hand without surgery. So here's an example of how that works. The first thing I do 
is I try the pencil test and I see if the pencil takes away or the pain or helps the movement. And then we build relative motion flexion or extension splints that simulate the pencil and will solve many of these pain problems. So this next patient is a, a, a veterinary orthopedic surgeon. So she operates on animals. She's a veterinarian and she's got pain in her hand that's making it difficult for her to operate. There is pain in here where you fell uh, in January, six months ago, mm -hmm. and it's been sore ever since then. Yeah. Making a fist hurts right. and rotating. Okay. So holding a scalpel blade and I have to rotate or holding a Oshner. Yeah, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a little bit like when you go see the eye doctor. You know how they, can you see better with these glasses or these glasses? You know, they flip the lens, right? So that's kind of what we're gonna do. Uh, it's called a pencil test. And what's gonna happen here is you're gonna put your elbows on the table like your grandmother told you not to. And I'll bet if you do that, it hurts, right? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Now we're gonna try this. And we're going to say, does that hurt more than that? Or are they the same? And then we're going to try it the other way. And we're going to say, does that hurt more than that? Or are they the same? You know what? I'll help it. But there we go. Right. So does that hurt more than this? Or is it the same? It's the same. Okay. And let's try it this way. Does that hurt more than this? Or is it the same? It doesn't hurt at all when you did that. It didn't hurt at all when we did that. No. Let's try that again. So right now, that's feeling better like that than it is like this. Yes, now it's starting to hurt. Now it's starting to hurt. Okay, let's put that back in there for just a minute. And we're going to talk while you're moving it a little bit. So if that takes away a lot of the pain, mm -hmm. then what we can do is do uh, build you a relative motion extension splint. So that's a splint you can actually continue to do surgery with. Oh, okay. my, my partner, Jeff Cook, uh, he was able to operate with a relative motion splint. If we rebalance the forces in such a way that you can still use your hand and the pain is not there, pain is nature's way of saying to you, hey, would you quit that? I'm trying to heal in here and you're screwing it up, stop that. And, but if we can rebalance the forces that allow you to move but without pain, then we're allowing your body to heal. And sometimes people need to wear these relative motion splints for a month or two months, or maybe even three, depending on how long you've had pain. Now you've had pain for a long time. It's been six months. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's feeling pretty good right now, yeah. is it? Yeah, it doesn't hurt. It's not hurting when you're doing that. No. So in that case, it's really worth trying a relative motion splint. And you may not be able to use it all the time. It's better if you can, because each time you do something that hurts, it's your body saying, okay, now it's gonna take longer. <laughs> And it's been going on six months. So if we can break the cycle, take the pain away and let it heal, then we'll be in better shape. And within 48 hours, the pain was gone. You were just saying. Yep. In 48 hours, I noticed that the pain was gone. Great. And it was sore for six months. Yes. You'd had physio. Mm -hmm. And show me your movement now. That doesn't hurt. Nope. And take it off if you don't mind, because you were just telling me that the little finger had a problem before that's improving already. So I was having a hard time making a fist. Yeah. And I can make a fist without pain. Wow. And also, it didn't want to come in very well. It stayed out. And now it's coming. Now it's coming back in again. Wow. And just after four weeks. Mm -hmm. So you think the splint's done it for you? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. And I can show you many of these cases in that paper that I just told you about. And so if you have patients that you had a hand fracture or, or they just fell and they come in and they say, geez, doctor, my hand hurts. 
don't just ignore them and send them away just because they don't have an x-ray that you can fix. <laughs> just try the pencil test. And if the pencil takes their pain away, have your therapist build a relative motion splint and you will rebalance the forces so the body can heal. And your patients will think that you are a little bit magical and your therapists will love you because they are really helping patients. So hand therapists love uh, this concept and they probably know about it. <laughs> but if they don't know about it, get them to read the paper too and you'll find this uh, very useful. I'm gonna show you another example. She had a fifth metacarpal fracture and three months after the metacarpal fracture, she was still sore. We met uh, a month ago and three months before that, you had fractured the fifth metacarpal, it was minimally displaced. Um, there wasn't the fracture that was the problem, but you had pain in your hand for three months. Can you show me where the pain was? I had pain through here. Yeah. And I had going up even through my middle finger, sort of like a, an ongoing vibration of pain. Right. And we did the pencil test a month mm -hmm. ago. Yeah. And in the relative motion flexion position with the fifth finger, it improved the pain. And so we built this relative motion flexion splint for you. Mm -hmm. And you've been wearing it most of the time for about a month. And I just saw you just now. So tell me how it's been. It's made a tremendous difference. I'm not getting the pain. The pain before actually would wake me up at night. The fact that you're a lot better after three um, months of pain is yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, and even the movement in that, my uh, range of motion in that finger and these three fingers here yeah, is good. good. Great. The day we put this on, you had not been able to do the yoga because of moves. And you really like that stuff. So you went home the day that we put this splint on. You told Lisa, no, I'm not going to be able to do yoga. And she said, well, try this. What did she tell you? And tell me what happened. She told me to take a towel and, and put it underneath my hand so that it was elevating this part of my hand. She said, just take your towel, pull it up, and put it underneath. And I was very skeptical because I thought, that's not going to work because I know how my moves go. And I knew the pain this was in beforehand. I put this on. I put the towel that night underneath my hand. And it worked. So, and I've been doing yoga every day since that with the towel. I have been down on my mat. The towel is always there. And it, I'm able to do it. So with the towel for that move, but with the relative motion splint, you've been able to do all your yoga moves? Yes. Right from the day we met you. And you had a hard time for three months. I couldn't do it. I was, I was, that's why my panic was setting in. I thinking, okay, I'm, this is not good. And now I know. Um, you know, when I take this off, I'll, it'll be fine. So those are two examples of very simple ways to solve problems. Uh, this man is a house painter and he's got snapping in his finger. Look at those tendons right there. That really, really hurts. But with the pencil there, it stopped the snapping and took the pain away. So I didn't have to operate on him because the pencil took his pain Let's away. Totally stopped the snapping. Yep. Happen. Okay. Ready? Yep. I'm sorry. Position slowly. Yeah. I can see that there's just no. No, this is the, 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 that's absolutely pain free. Good. I can't believe how much better it feels. Yeah, isn't that crazy? The difference it makes. Well, how's that? Blue little new best friend of yours. It's great. It's amazing. Just like I work every day, no discomfort. Just yeah, it's and and when you take it off, how's it feel it when takes, you take it off? Take it off. It's it's Getting... couldn't, couldn't do that before I put this on <laughs> without excruciating pain. Right. And you've only been wearing it for about a month, eh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, that's great. So you're gonna be painting this house today. Yes. So listen. Every day, yeah. Perfect. Thanks a lot. We'll see you later. Gotta okay. watch. So he went to work the day that my therapist built the splint. So I saw him in my office. He said, I can't work. I'm a painter. I tried the pencil test. It took his pain away. The next day he saw the therapist. She built the splint. He went right back to work with the splint. He had to wear the splint for about two months. And uh, I'm not even sure what the extensor snapping was. It doesn't matter. What matters is we fixed it and I didn't even have to operate on it. So he was delighted about that. 
These relative motion flexion splints are also helpful in Dupuytren's contracture. So this patient has a very severe Dupuytren's contracture of the fifth and small finger, the PIP and DIP. Now, passively, I can extend this finger, but actively, he cannot with Walland because of his MP hyperextension. He tries to extend the PIP, but all the force goes to the MP. But we show him in the surgery that if we put a relative motion flexion splint on, it drives the extensor force so to the PIP. And if the extensor force is in the PIP, then he's going to be okay. So he wears an extension splint at night. During the day, he wears the relative motion flexion splint. Take the splint off, please. We're now two and a half weeks after the Dupuytren surgery, and the PIP joint is extending better today. Fantastic. And make a fist. Straighten out. Right. And turn it over so we can see the other side. And make a fist and straighten out. So these relative motion flexion splints are good for PIP joint extensor leg after fracture. They're good for Dupuytren's contracture PIP extensor leg. They're good for extensor leg after flexor tendon uh, repair. And they're this, they are the answer after boutonniere, uh, for boutonniere fingers is the relative motion flexion splint. I just want to show a couple of other things with Wallant uh, in the few minutes that are left. This is a tibial hematoma evacuation. This is my resident injecting the local anesthesia. She injected 80 milliliters of 0.5% lidocaine with one in 200,000 epinephrine all around on the bone. You have to get right on the periosteum, always from proximal to distal. And uh, she did the injection. I did not. I showed her, just told her what to do. And the patient had almost zero pain. I haven't taken a tibial hematoma to the operating room in years. We've done them all in the minor procedure room. Uh, in the clinic, you just numb it up really well, scoop it out with your index finger, uh, apply Vaseline and a dry bandage uh, after their shower every day. And uh, I mean, you can put a vac on it or you can just do Vaseline with a dry bandage and let it heal after a daily shower. And that's gonna work very well. I don't know if you've seen this article. Uh, this is uh, simple, effective ways to care for skin wounds and incisions including tibial hematomas and all kinds of other wounds. Uh, this is a great review article with really, really good videos. It's simple, it's cheap, it's all shower, Vaseline, uh, dry dressing and let it heal. Uh, and uh, this uh, can be very, very helpful for you, for your nurses, for your patients. They don't have to buy very expensive dressings. Uh, they can even use panty liners, diapers, sanitary napkins. We've cultured those things and proven that they're sterile uh, or almost sterile. Uh, and um, this patient, for example, they sent these pictures to me from Ghana and said, Dr. Lalonde, when you come, we want you to operate on these exposed middle phalanges. Well, I brought Coban tape and Vaseline. That's all we brought. Uh, an unknown Indian plastic surgeon said, tissues are drying, tissues are crying, tissues are dying. And so they have to just keep Vaseline on the wounds so that they don't dry and die. And that was the problem with those fingers. The bones were drying and dying. And so by keeping them greasy, the uh, blood grew through the cortex of those bones and uh, I explained to the patient and a hand therapist how to wash in the sink and then clean with bottled water because that's cleaner than tap water in Ghana and then apply Vaseline and Coban tape. 
And uh, I showed the patient and the hand therapist how to do that. There it is at four weeks after, and the granulation tissue has grown through the outer cortex of those middle phalanges. And in the little finger, you can still see the head of the middle phalanx still sticking out of the wound. So they took this person to the minor procedure room outside the operating room with wall end, took a ronger and took off this middle head of uh, the uh, little finger. Uh, so there they are. There's the head of the middle phalanx sticking out of the wound. They took a ronger, took it off with wall end. And then it went on to heal. And there's the patient at five months with healed wounds, never went to the operating room other than to ronger off the head of that middle phalanx. Uh, that was it. This is the last case, and then I'm going to stop. This is an 83 year old woman who skinned her fingers and ruptured her central slips of both the ring and long fingers. And we washed that with tap water. She never went to the operating room. The central slip is gone. The uh, cartilage off the dorsal part of the PIP joint is gone. The lateral bands are still dorsal to the axis of the PIP joint because it's just the day after injury. So she still has not yet developed a boutonniere. And you can see that she can extend her PIP. So we just tack what's left of the skin back. That's the only surgery she had in a minor procedure room, never went to the OR. And then we put Vaseline and Coban. And if you put Vaseline and Coban tape, bones will heal, joints will heal, tendons will heal. You do not need flaps on these. And the relative motion flexion splint solved her boutonniere problem. Uh, and that's a whole other lecture all by itself, how to solve boutonniere problems with relative motion flexion splints. And um, the therapists changed her dressings daily for the first week. There she is at seven days. Granulation tissue is starting to grow across the extensor tendons, the PIP joint, the denuded exposed PIP joints. And the splint is letting her live at home independently. She's 83 years old, was never admitted to hospital. Now all the skin is healed. At three months, we stop the relative motion flexion splints. No boutonniere, no flaps, no hospital admissions. Simple healing with Vaseline and Coban tape, just like is in that PRS uh, Global Open paper. So I'm gonna stop there and quit sharing my screen and just open it up for uh, questions if there are any, if any of you are still uh, wide awake. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Lalonde. Actually, I gained uh, a lot of uh, tips and the tricks. I enjoyed your lecture uh, very much. And I want you to, uh, to uh, uh, excuse me for, uh, a lot of questions I have received. I have time, go ahead. Okay. So uh, first of all, it's uh, uh, the enjoyable uh, part of uh, the Wallen is you, you are receiving your results immediately. So most of us wants to see what is, will be uh, my results of surgery. So it's the most amazing thing, I think. So you, you know your results immediately and this is very enjoyable for surgeon, of course. Uh, first question about the preparation of your solution. So uh, uh, I'm sure you, you met this in thousands of patients. So don't you think about making uh, a specific bottle uh, ready by this type of dilution uh, instead of making this mixture every time for uh, each surgery? Yeah, that's a very good question. And a lot of surgeons do that. They just take a 500 cc bag of saline <laughs> and put in, you know, lidocaine with epinephrine. And uh, there's, you can do it that way. Uh, I come in in the morning and I take 20 minutes and prepare all my solutions. Uh, and then I just draw from prepared saline or from prepared syringes all day. It, you know, in the old days when I used to operate with a suit coat, I'd have 
10 syringes in this pocket and 10 syringes in this pocket. And I just, boom and boom. <laughs> so yeah, you can be more efficient. I think that's smart. People, okay. I, I've met people in Spain and Iceland and a number of other countries that do that. They, they prepare their wallet solution. And, and or I, I know one surgeon in Winnipeg, Canada, who had his secretary mix the lidocaine with adrenaline and the saline and the bicarb because the hospital didn't want his nurses to do it. He said, fine, I'm going to have my secretary do it. He showed her how to do it. And she mixed his syringe. Okay. Uh, so about uh, 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 how how did you reach this mixture sol uh, solution? So uh, did you do trials until you did this uh, ideal uh, type of dilution, the amount of saline and uh, bicarb and uh, so on, or how did you reach to these numbers? Right. The, the bicarb, yes, that we had a resident try different concentrations of bicarbonate. And uh, what he found is that for one in 100,000 uh, epinephrine with 1% lidocaine, the right combination was one to 10. So one cc of bicarb for 10 cc's of lidocaine with epinephrine. And for us, that was very lucky because we have our bottles uh, they're 20 milliliter bottles and they will take two milliliters extra. So you can put two milliliters of bicarbonate in a 20 cc bottle and it's all set. And also a 10 cc syringe holds 11 cc's. So if you take up one cc of bicarb and then fill the syringe to 11 cc's with 1% lidocaine with one in 100,000, your pH goes from 4.3 to 7.4 <laughs> and bingo, it doesn't hurt anymore to put it in. Now the 1% with one in a hundred thousand is not magical. So in Europe, they use 1% uh, lidocaine with one in 200,000 epinephrine and it works fine for the Europeans. I don't think it matters that much. Teddy Prasetyono uses one in a million epinephrine in Indonesia. And he says, I, I can see just fine. I don't need more than one in a million epinephrine, Don. I don't know why you use one in a hundred thousand epinephrine. And I use one in a hundred thousand epinephrine because that's what I have in my hospital. <laughs> you know, when we started this, I wasn't planning on telling the whole world about it. I just wanted to use what I had. Um, okay. Uh, do you have an, a contraindication for Welland? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there are some contraindications to Welland. If you're a surgeon who doesn't like talking to patients, don't do this. If you're a surgeon who is very impatient, okay, you can't wait for the local anesthesia to work, don't do this. <laughs> If you have a patient who's very, very nervous, like we talked about to, you know, don't try this, just put them to sleep, you know, wait until you get better at it. But, and the same goes with children. If you explain to children, look, you need to hold still when I put a needle in, if, if their eyes go wonky and they start to cry, put them to sleep. Um, I'm not worried at all about epinephrine, even with Raynaud's. But don't start with Raynaud's, okay? Yes. And don't, don't start with people who have renal failure and black fingertips. <laughs> There's no blood going, or Berger's disease. You know, yes. you don't need epinephrine in those fingers. Don't ask for trouble. If there's no blood going to the finger, you don't need epinephrine. So those are all patients that I think are relative contraindications. Uh, also, if I uh, have a like a sarcoma in a forearm uh, and I really want to see very, very well, then I'll use a tourniquet and put people to sleep. Or if I have um, even a giant cell tumor in a finger and I really want to see very well because it's wrapped underneath the tendon and the bone and stuff, then I'll use a finger tourniquet after I use Wallant in the palm. Uh, or um, if I am doing uh, maybe a schwannoma, 
where I really need to see everything perfectly and two red cells might get in my way, then I might use a finger tourniquet if it's you know on the finger. It, it depends. But the whiter my hair gets, uh, the fewer the contraindications I have, you know, because you kind of get used to working around everything. Okay. Uh, regarding the mini plates, uh, one question stilling the, the photos you showed is the old form of plates. I so know. maybe the small designs of mini plates uh, with low profile get uh, better functions or a better outcome. So what's your opinion? Yeah, no, for sure. I know I was showing, showing old plates that were thick. But, you know, and I know that the new plates are way better because they're smaller. But you're still doing all that dissection. And it's not about the plate. It's about how much scar people form over the plate because everybody forms a different amount of scar. And some people form a lot of scar over even really small plates. So, you know, I, I still think the same thing holds. Uh, you know, I think that the less dissection you do, the better. Dr. Kolb, I think you're doing percutaneous screws, right? For yes. uh, finger fractures. Yes. The, yeah. The, Canal technique, the, you know, and, and I think that's that may be the best way because it's minimal dissection. It's just a little stab wound, you know, and that may be a very good thing to do. The only reason I haven't done it is because I'm waiting for the long term results to make sure that I'm not going to get more arthritis in my PIP joint or my MP joint. I'm waiting for the long term follow ups before I commit to that. And also, you know, the, the compression screws, they're beautiful, they're fun, but they're expensive. And yes. the, the Canadian healthcare system is very cheap. Yes. <laughs> and, and, you know, they say, well, why can't you use a K wire for that? You know, okay. and I, I go, well, you know, cause these things are sexy and I want to do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> of course. <laughs> Uh, about uh, burying the, the tip of the, the K wire. So uh, one question, uh, aren't you afraid from uh, wire migration? Yeah, yeah, I've had K wire migration. I've had it all, you know, I've had to go chase K wires. Uh, I've had some infections with K wires coming out of the skin. I've had some infections with K wires under the skin, but I have learned that if you get patients to not do what hurts, you don't get K-wire infections. And yeah, I'm gonna have to chase the occasional K-wire with surgery, but I'm also gonna have to take out the occasional plate with surgery. You know, one of the biggest problems we have in Canada is it's cold here. It's not cold where you guys are in Cairo. <laughs> but when I put a plate on in Canada and somebody goes outside and it's minus 20 degrees below zero, they come in saying, doctor, would you take this damn plate out of here? Cause it really is cold in the winter time. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, about uh, the complex uh, regional pain syndrome. Uh, have you did a study to see is a percentage of uh, complex regional pain syndrome it might be reduced with wallant or not? Yeah, that, you know, that's a very good question. And I don't know the answer. Uh, I do know that I have had one patient that I repaired his extensor tendon with wallant and he got complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, having said that, I have met a lot of surgeons because there's a lot of people doing wallant now. And I've met a lot of surgeons who are convinced that their patients get less complex regional pain syndrome with wall amp. Um, and I don't know enough about it. I know a lot about is complex regional study, pain yeah. syndrome, but I just is don't there, know the answer. Is there a study actually? Yeah, it would be a good, a good study, I think. Complex regional pain syndrome, people send them to me all the time because I'm very patient. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. I talk to the patients and, and they need somebody to listen to them and they need somebody to believe that they have a problem. That's what they need more than anything. And they need to stay off drugs and they need to keep their range of motion and they need to accept that we don't have a magic bullet. Uh, what's your opinion about the distraction arthroplasty, which is a Suzuki frame? Ah, I love it. Suzuki frames are great. I just didn't show any. 
Mm. But I think Suzuki frames or uh, the banjo splint, you know, Bob Skank from Chicago, his banjo splint, anything that pulls a PIP joint that's exploded, <laughs> if you pull it apart and let them move a little bit so they don't get stuck is great. We, we use a lot of skank banjo splits. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question about the, the Putrin contracture. So if you have a specific tips and tricks for doing a Putrin contracture, uh, you have shown one case with a lag of extension and uh, uh, inability to make full extension and you, you use this uh, relative motion uh, extension procedure. So yeah. do you have other trips, uh, tips and tricks for deputrins uh, using Wallant? Yeah, you know, I think that one of the best things about Wallant with deputrins uh, is that patients get to see what really they can do. You know, what we can do passively and what they can do actively is often two different things. And so they're not disappointed and we're not disappointed after surgery because we can see how much extension they can get, especially in the PIP joint. The MP joint is not a problem. It's the PIP joint that's the problem. And you can simulate a relative motion flexion splint during surgery with a tongue depressor and you can see how much better it is. And so... I think that's very helpful. I will say one thing about Dupuytrens. Don't start Wallant with Dupuytrens because it bleeds more. It's, it's harder than the other operations because epinephrine doesn't work on big arteries. It doesn't work on digital arteries. Digital arteries are big arteries. And when I do Dupuytrens, I'm looking at the digital arteries, pum, 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 pum. I can see them pulsate. Epinephrine one in a hundred thousand does not stop digital arteries from pumping, but the little arterioles that come off the digital arteries, when you strip those, because you're trying to get around a spiral cord when you're doing Dupuytrens, those little bastards bleed. <laughs> so Dupuytrens does bleed. And for the rookie surgeon, if you're just learning Dupuytrens, don't start learning Dupuytrens with Wallant. Start with a tourniquet, start with people asleep until you get good at Dupuytrens because it's hard to do Dupuytrens with blood. And it's hard for me to teach residents how to do Dupuytrens with Wallant because there is a lot of bleeding. Yes. Uh, another question related to the soft tissue uh, dressing you, you you have shown with this uh, Rana patient. Uh, how often uh, did you ask the patient to do his dressing? Ah, yeah. You mean like the tibial hematoma and the coban with fingers once a day? Once a day. Yeah. yeah every day they take the coban off the fingers or the the coban off the leg, or if it's a big face wound, same thing, take the dressing off, get in the shower, let water run over everything. If your shower water is dirty, rinse it with bottled water, because that's going to be cleaner than tap water if the tap water is dirty. And then put a big layer of Vaseline, really, really thick, and rewrap with coban tape, and away you go, once a day. And we do the same thing for all our fingertip injuries. We just let them heal. I'm not much of a flapper for fingertips. I just let them heal. Because there is an opinion that uh, you, you should wait for some time for granulation tissue. So you interrupt this granulation, new granulation with uh, daily dressing. So what do you think? I don't think so. I, I think you can just get in the shower and put Vaseline on fresh wounds right away. In fact, that's what we do with all our burns. Uh, that's what I do with all my, all the table saw fingers, you know, you know what they're like, like they're yes. a mess, right? Yes. So first, first thing I do as soon, as soon as I see them in the clinic is we walk over to the sink and we let water run over it. And then I put a thick layer of Vaseline on and then we wrap them with Coban. And then we either do relative motion, like if it's an extensor tendon injury, we do relative motion flexion splints, right? on the, over the PIP joints. 
uh, another question regarding the soft tissue defects, traumatic uh, to use the, the VAC. Uh, do you use VAC for, for uh, the negative pressure VAC for so, uh, such uh, soft tissue defects in preparation for a flap or uh, to prepare the wound for uh, a split sickness skin graft? So what is your no. opinion about using this negative pressure? Yeah, I, I the vac or vacuum assisted closure or negative pressure, I love it. We, you know, I, it has made so many, as a plastic surgeon, it takes big holes and makes them little holes. <laughs> and then you can close the little holes with wall ant with stitches. Yes. <laughs> Whereas before we used to use skin grafts and flaps and all that, you know, in uh, about three months ago, I had a lady who had a uh, hematoma from her mid thorax to the knee, the hematoma was this big. It was like mm. an eight pound baby. Mm. Mm. I, I never took her to the operating room. We mm. just local anesthesia, put my hand in there, took out all the hematoma on the floor in the hospital with a headlight. And then we put a vac on let the vac do its magic. And then last week we put local anesthesia and did secondary closure with stitches. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah, I love the vac. <laughs> Louis okay. Argenta, Louis Argenta, the guy who invented it. He's, yes. I think he's brilliant, you know. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lalon. I'm uh, Please excuse me that I spend a lot of time asking you questions, but uh, I thought this is a very good chance for me and for the audience. Uh, I see a lot of uh, thankful expressions from all audience uh, from everywhere. So I would like to uh, uh, thank you very much from the Egyptian Society of Surgery Fund and Microsurgery. And it was my honor to, uh, to make this uh, event with, uh, with you. Uh, and they would like to meet you uh, again and again in webinars or face to face like before. Uh, and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Professor Kolb, uh, and all of you, Professor Sadek and Dr. Farouk, who organized this. I really and the technical team at Extreme. Uh, I appreciate all of your help and Professor Nakib. Uh, thank you too. It was great to. Uh, meet you all and to speak with you and I hope that you have a nice evening and a nice week. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And very elegant presentation and excellent cases. Uh, we are delighted to have you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're most welcome. Thank you, Professor Lalong. You're welcome, Professor Sadek. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم باسمي وباسم مجموعة شركات تايجر جروب وفي طريعتها شركة تي اي جي فارما بنرحب وبنتشرف باستضافة مؤتمر مجموعة أو جراحي أو الجراحة اليد المصرية وإن شاء الله طبعا بنتشرف في مواجبة أحداث المؤتمر اللي نظمه واللي بيحضره كوكبة من كبار أطباء المصري بننتهز الحقيقة الفرصة أن أنا في عجالة بألقي الضوء على مجموعة شركات تايجر جروب المجموعة دي الحقيقة كان اللي أسسها مجموعة من رجال الأعمال المصريين الشرفاء اللي بينتموا بيحبوا البلد وأما اتكلموا مع بعضهم قالوا إن إحنا لازم يكون لنا دور ودور مؤثر وفعال نضيف فيه لبلدنا خلال ثورة التنمية اللي مصر بتعيشها 
في التوقيت الحالي وبناء على كده احنا قررنا ان احنا نتوسع في عدد شركات المجموعة في مختلف الانشطة اللي كلها الحقيقة يعني بتمثل اضافة للاقتصاد المصري بتحاول يكون لها دور في تحقيق مخطط وخطة تطوير مصر عشرين ثلاثين وصلت شركات تايجر جروب حتى الان خمس شركات وفي بدايتها كانت شركة تايجر للتنمية وكانت ابرز انشطتها هي الانشطة الخدمية وحيث ان احنا في مستهل مؤتمر طبي فبنقول ان على طريعة الانشطة ديت انشطة التطهير والتعقيم والمكافحة ثم كانت الشركة الثانية اللي هي شركة تايجر للتنمية المستدامة ودي بتعمل في مجالات الاستثمار والتطوير العقاري اما الشركة الثالثة اللي هي شركة بلاك شادو فهي دي شركة بتختص بالاعمال الامنية من حيث تأمين المنشآت من حيث تأمين الشخصيات العامة من حيث تأمين المنشآت من خلال تدبير وتوريد الانظمة التأمين الالكترونية المختلفة ثم هناك في شركة ضوء ودي شركة متخصصة في الشحن والتخليص الجمركي وأعمال النقل وكانت دورة التاج بالنسبة لنا اللي هي تي اي جي فارما والشركة ديت مختصة في إنتاج وتجارة الأدوية بمناسبة انعقاد المؤتمر اللي احنا بنسعد بوجودنا معاه فاحنا بنحاول نعبر لحضراتكم عن مدى جديتنا ورغبتنا في فتح أفق وأطر للتعاون مع الجمعية وإحنا مستعدين إن إحنا إن شاء الله نسخر كل إمكانيات الشركة والمجموعة لتلبية أي مطالب أو مقترحات لجمعية حضراتكم الموقرة في النهاية إن أنا بنعبر عن شكرنا عن أطيب تمنياتنا للمؤتمر بالنجاح بإذن الله تعالى وإن شاء الله يكون في بيننا لقاءات أكتر وأكتر في كافة المجالات وشكرا جزيلا الرحمن الرحيم آه باسمي وباسم مجموعة شركات آه تايجر جروب آه وفي طريعتها آه شركة تي اي جي فارما آه بنرحب وبنتشرف باستضافة آه مؤتمر آه مجموعة أو جراحي أو الجراحة اليد المصرية وإن شاء الله طبعا آه بنتشرف في مواجبة أحداث المؤتمر اللي نظمه واللي بيحضره كوكبة من كبار أطباء المصريين بننتهز الحقيقة الفرصة ان انا في عجالة بألقي الضوء على مجموعة شركات تايجر جروب المجموعة دي الحقيقة كان اللي أسسها مجموعة من رجال الأعمال المصريين الشرفاء اللي بينتموا وبيحبوا البلد وأما اتكلموا مع بعضهم قالوا ان احنا لازم يكون لنا دور ودور مؤثر وفعال اه نضيف فيه لبلدنا خلال ثورة التنمية اللي مصر بتعيشها في اه التوقيت الحالي وبناء على كده احنا قررنا ان احنا نتوسع في عدد شركات اه المجموعة في مختلف الانشطة اللي كلها الحقيقة يعني بتمثل إضافة للاقتصاد المصري بتحاول يكون لها دور في تحقيق مخطط وخطة تطوير مصر عشرين ثلاثين وصلت شركات تايجر جروب حتى الآن خمس شركات وفي بدايتها كانت شركة تايجر للتنمية وكانت أبرز أنشطتها هي الأنشطة الخدمية وحيث أن احنا 
في مستهل مؤتمر طبي فبنقول ان على طريقه الانشطه ديت انشطه التطهير والتعقيم والمكافحه ثم كانت الشركه الثانيه اللي هي شركه تايجر للتنميه المستدامه ودي بتعمل في مجالات الاستثمار والتطوير العقاري اما الشركه الثالثه اللي هي شركه بلاك شادو فهي دي شركه بتختص بالاعمال الامنيه من حيث تامين المنشات من حيث تامين الشخصيات العامه من حيث تامين المنشات من خلال تدبير وتوريد الانظمه التامين الالكترونيه المختلفه ثم هناك في شركة ضوء ودي شركة متخصصة في الشحن والتخليص الجمركي وأعمال النقل وكانت دورة التاج بالنسبة لنا اللي هي تي اي جي فارما والشركة ديت مختصة في إنتاج وتجارة الأدوية بمناسبة انعقاد المؤتمر اللي احنا بنسعد بوجودنا معاه فاحنا بنحاول نعبر لحضراتكم عن مدى جديتنا ورغبتنا في فتح افق واطر للتعاون مع الجمعيه واحنا مستعدين ان احنا ان شاء الله نسخر كل امكانيات الشركه والمجموعه لتلبيه اي مطالب او مقترحات لجمعيه حضراتكم الموقره. في النهايه اني انا بنعبر عن شكرنا عن اطيب تمنياتنا للمؤتمر بالنجاح باذن الله تعالى وان شاء الله يكون في بينا لقاءات اكثر واكثر في كافه المجالات وشكرا جزيلا